Over the past several weeks, we've been you know, kind of flirting uh, with underlying questions that uh, are really paramount in, in our lives and our existence. And, and what they uh, really uh, tune into is what is reality? What is symbol? What is religious belief? And, you know, the three intermix, but, you know, if you look at reality, I mean, this is it. I mean, this is what we consider reality, that which is physical. We can see, we can feel, we can touch, we can smell, we can sense it. And then, uh, on, on the other hand, you have symbol, which uh, is a big part of the foundations that were laid for us uh, in the ancient times uh, to try to somehow prepare us to understand these oncoming things. And, and then, you know, uh, this was also the symbol uh, was connected to, you know, religious, religious beliefs. Uh, reality, you know, more, uh, at least in my way of looking at things, uh, connected to or connects to a science science and, and physics because we're, we're talking about uh, what has actually been seen, not what one has faith in, but the, you know, evidence of things that are really uh, necessary in order for the earth uh, to, to, to operate the way it does in order for the universe to operate. Now, when, what we did is we kind of began to construct a thesis about this, uh, and it was relative to those questions, and it was based on the existence of a word. And the word, as we'll see here in the first slide, is quintessence, okay? And, and so that become, or that became a, a kind of catalyst for us to, to, to look at all of this stuff as one, you know? In other words, we take all of this and it, and it comes into this matter uh, called quintessence. And that's the word. So we, we worked on that word, uh, and as we have, we got into a lot of detail and, uh, about it. But there was something that we found initially strange about that word. If we look at the next slide, what we find here are two people, one of course long gone, who lived in, in the days of ancient Greece, Aristotle, the other very much with us, who is a professor, Einstein Professor Emeritus at Princeton University, Paul Steinert, uh, you know, thousands of years apart. But the, the interesting thing about these two people is that both Aristotle of ancient Greece and today's Professor Paul Steinert of Princeton University connect immediately to the word and to the work relative to the meaning of quintessence. In fact, Paul Steinert actually has a particular uh, part of his work at Princeton which is devoted to quintessence. And uh, Aristotle was probably one of the, uh, the first, although there might have been some, you know, even before him, who uh, reached the conclusion that in order for there to be uh, a universe, there had to be quintessence. Now, quintessence is universal dark matter, dark energy, and both Aristotle and Steinhardt connected to that word in their work of exploring the existence of an invisible power. And that's what both of them work on. Uh, Steiner is working on it now. Uh, Aristotle came up with the idea. An invisible power that makes up 90% of the universe that really can't be seen, but somewhere has to be there in order to control and in order to operate this whole structure. There, you know, there, 
uh, they reach the conclusion there, you know, in order for uh, the earth to revolve, the sun, the planets to go where they have to go and all this stuff, there has to be some force. Um, you know, and, and so you had two forces in quintessence. You have dark matter, which uh, kind of is, is the force of the power uh, of the movement of everything. And then you have dark energy, which is that which kind of holds it all together, <laughs> like putting, you know, tape around a package because uh, if you don't have dark energy, then everything would just go flying off, because, you know, but something holds it together. So Aristotle reached that conclusion thousands of years ago, and Steinhardt is working on that conclusion today. So we connected quintessence as the strange, invisible power of the universe, which makes up 90% of you know, what's out there. And we also connected quintessence with classic ancient Greece, and contemporary science of today. Now, in addition to these two, we connected quintessence to another description of invisible cosmic power that adds another contributor to Aristotle and Steinhardt. And, and this was the interest, this, this is where, you know, we've got ancient Greece, we've got contemporary science, and now, amazingly, with this quintessence, we are going to bring into the mix religion or the Bible. Watch what I'm saying here. Here, we have the Indo-Europe, well, first of all, the picture is of Pentecost, you know, the Holy Ghost coming down upon the earth and upon the people. The Indo-European root for quintessence, this comes from the dictionary, is P-E-N-K-W-E, -E, which involved into such words as finger, fist, voice, pentagon, pentathlon, posse, kino, and Pentecost. So the word Pentecost, or the coming down of an invisible power on the earth, connects to quintessence, which is a word that was known uh, in, in Greek uh, translation, to Aristotle, and it's actually being worked on now by um, Steinhardt. So uh, the word quintessence has this religious connotation of Pentecost, and it's all coming back to this dark energy or dark matter, which makes up 90% of the universe, but which is an invisible power. So. The Bible speaks of Pentecost as this power descending upon the earth. Aristotle and, and, and the scientists of today uh, a look at quintessence, which comes from Pentecost, as this invisible power uh, affecting the earth. So there's a real, a real connection there. So now what have we connected? And, and this is what really got me, and, and, and we'll look at the next one. What we have connected is ancient Greece, the classic Greek teachers, Aristotle, the contemporary science of those like Paul Steinhardt, and the Bible. And they're all talking about the same thing. An invisible energy that comes down and affects the earth. And it is uh, known uh, in science, in, in ancient classical Greece, and, and in the Bible, uh, you know, as the word connected to quintessence. So now we know that, and we, we, we've, we've gone through this, you know, in a couple, for a couple of weeks and uh, uh, really have, you know, torn it apart and got into it deeply. But we know that the Pentecost of the Bible, which is the Holy Ghost falling down upon the earth and touching people, is the same invisible force first mentioned by Aristotle, and now being investigated by Professor Steinhardt at Princeton, <clears throat> as well as a host of other scientists and physicists. Aristotle never mentioned it as Pentecost. Paul Steinhardt never mentioned it as Pentecost. But they both mentioned it as an invisible power 
that makes up 90% of the universe and affects planet Earth. An invisible power of tremendous proportion. They both said that. And the word that they were using, uh, this in Greek and this in English, quintessence, connects to the biblical description of Pentecost, which is also this invisible power coming down to earth. So then, what we did, we looked at that old you know, religious painting that I showed you a moment ago of Pentecost and this power coming down on earth. And what we did is we took the uh, description that comes from Steiner uh, and just put it on to this uh, Pentecost picture uh, or Pentecost artwork from long ago. And uh, what do we get? And it's very interesting. Here we're looking at the Pentecostal picture, you know, the Holy Ghost coming down and touching people. But we're looking at the scientific description of mysterious subatomic particles from another galaxy could be raining down on planet Earth according to a collaboration of astronomers. Mysterious subatomic particles from another galaxy raining down upon planet Earth. Put that scientific statement together with this ancient painting or old painting, and it becomes really believable stuff. It, you know, well, you looked at this before, and it was something that you, know, you went to church and you had faith about. Now you get to the point where you don't really have to have so much faith because this kind of stuff is being studied by probably the most eminent physicist around here uh, in Princeton University. So then our premise here is that quintessence, or the invisible force that makes up the 90% of the universe is actually what we have for many, many years in our religious training referred to as the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is Pentecost, agreed. The Holy Ghost is quintessence, which is connected. The Holy Ghost then was indirectly evaluated and mentioned by Aristotle, and the Holy Ghost now is indirectly being studied by Paul Steiner at Princeton University. Of course, he didn't know that, but he knows everything else. Now, that would also explain the symbolic gesture that's required in the scriptures of giving 10%, you know, which religion has twisted and, you know, demands 10% of your money. But what's being spoken of here is that this power makes up 90% of the universe, leaving you with 10% inside of your brain. The Holy Ghost part is the right hemisphere, 90%. Uh, your part, which we operate with daily, is 10%. So what uh, the scripture says, that if you go into meditation, you separate from the thoughts of the mind, you are then tithing. You give your 10% and you find yourself immersed in this realm of quintessence or this dark energy or this Holy Ghost power that's within you. So, so this understanding... Of, of the Holy Ghost, uh, and both from a, a Greek standpoint of long ago, uh, from a standpoint of uh, uh, the Bible, and from the standpoint of what's being studied today. This understanding then took a decided turn in, in our work as a result of an encounter announced by scientists in England. The scientist in England announced, this was a couple of weeks ago, really, that for the first time in the history of world science, that this invisible universal power of quintessence or dark energy had been touched and measured. Now, you know, in other words, it was as if, you know, this scientist is saying, we now have touched 
this. We've, we've measured it. Uh, this otherworldly uh, Holy Ghost thing, we've touched it. Let me, let me show you. The, the announcement was made by English physicist Jerry Gilmore, and, and I'll show you it here. And he's of Institute of Astronomy at Cambridge in England. And his words are even really interesting. He says, these are the first properties other than existence that we've been able to determine. In other words, he's saying that for the very, very first time, we have touched properties that previously were considered to be outside of existence. This is the, the invisible part. This is that uh, a Holy Ghost part, if you would. So <laughs> without him you know, entering into where I'm at, he in essence is saying, uh, you know, if I was to use the word, this here, for the very first time, we have touched this thing that in one way or the other connects to what we know as the Holy Ghost or the power of the Holy Spirit. So we have gone beyond reality, we have gone beyond physical existence, and actually touched the very thing that science and the Bible agree is the power of the other world, the power of Pentecost. We have literally touched the Holy Ghost. Now, I mean, you know, I, I'd have to say, well, you know, if if all of this is, adds up, but I, I, I can't, I, you know, and I, I've thought of this and looked at it over and over again, and I, and I can't see any way that it doesn't add up, uh, simply because of the fact that this is an invisible power of dark matter, of dark energy, that comes down and touches the earth, and that it is called by science, and was called back by the classic Greeks, quintessence, which is being studied now, and that word quintessence connects to the word Pentecost, which is the invisible power coming down upon the earth, and this professor here, Gilmore, says we've touched it, and he, oh, and, and he, he also goes on in making this statement, which to me is really amazing, that this is the first time that anybody has ever touched something that is outside of existence, <laughs> you know. It doesn't exist, but we've touched it. Now, having accumulated this amount of information and uh, you know, being pretty confident uh, on what we're seeing here, uh, we were introduced to a Mexican physicist by the name of Carlos Frank, F-R-E-N-K. And what he found further strengthens, strengthens the dark matter Pentecost, Holy Ghost connection. Let's take a look. Where is the Missing Matter by Carlos Frank, which you can see. Dr. Carlos Frank, a Mexican-born astrophysicist, is professor of astrophysics at Durham University in England, currently the principal investigator of the Virgo Consortium, a team of astrophysicists. Okay? And um, what he said was that basically an axion, he used the word axion. Now, an axion is a hypothetical uh, particle. So, Frank is saying that in this dark matter, in this missing matter, there, there is something and, and, and though nobody can really touch it yet or put their finger on what it is, it's some kind of thing. I mean, so we, we'd have to talk about it hypothetically. So we call it axion. And, and, he, and then he, he added to that axion condensate. And, and condensate is something that forms out of the heat or cold. So what he's saying was there is something, axion, hypothetical, which forms inside of this dark matter that actually constitutes non-local consciousness. So he's saying that basically what he found was that this dark matter, this dark energy, 
this quintessence is conscious. It thinks, you know, it feels. There's an intelligence connected to it. See? And, and when, when he's looking at this, and he comes to the conclusion that there's an intelligence in here. Okay? Now he said it, it, he has to look at it hypothetically. He said, he, there, there has to be an intelligence in there. And he says that it, it's almost like condensation that comes out, you know, when you have hot and cold together. And he says, what, from, the, from the forces inside of here, this consciousness evolves, and it's intelligent. So now, we're having this, uh, this Holy Ghost thing uh, being described by this Carlos Frank as, as an intelligence, uh, something intelligent, something conscious, something like you that thinks, that can advise, that communicates. See? So it's no longer just a, a dark energy hovering somewhere. No, he said that it is a axion condensate, which means there's something that has or did evolve in this dark matter that is conscious. Can you add such a thing? There's a personal there are personalities. One personality, millions, billions, we don't know. But when you talk about a consciousness being in dark matter, and, and that's what he discovered. Then, then it takes you back into the Bible, and you come up with the scripture, and it becomes meaningful to you. John 14, 26, the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, quintessence, whom the Father, God, will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatever I have said unto you. So here's the scripture saying, this ghost, this invisible force is intelligent. This invisible force is so intelligent, it will teach you. This invisible force will bring you and, and touch your mind so that you will remember things. So what that says, and what Carlos Frank says, is one and the same, that in this invisible power, there is a conscious individual, a conscious being, a conscious power of some kind. And, and once again, that slips, that Holy Ghost slips it right back into the quintessence Pentecost business. And, 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 and so everything connects. Everything connects perfectly. Okay? And as each scientist or each physicist comes up with another description, and we find in the scriptures what that's talking about, because here you're thinking on dark matter or dark energy or some out there that, you know, you can't see it, you can't feel it, but yeah, what the heck is it? And now the scientists are, are studying it and, and finding out they've touched it and, and blah, blah, and they've got uh, it to the point where it's some kind of a being of consciousness. And you see right here that we could change the words and say the comforter, which is quintessence, the comforter, which is dark matter, which will be sent, will come and teach you all things which would line up perfectly with what Carlos Frank said. So let's add that statement of Carlos Frank to that Pentecost painting we showed you earlier, along with the scientific statement. Let's take a look and see what we've got now. So here we see it again, the Pentecost. A mysterious subatomic particles from another galaxy could be raining down on planet Earth according to a collaboration of astronomers. And here the scripture says, the comforter which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. Now, Carlos Frank said that these subatomic particles from this other galaxy raining down as dark matter, dark energy quintessence are conscious and intelligent, and the scripture says that this stuff coming down, or this thing or entity coming down, is intelligent and will teach you. Now, when we talk then about such things as the Holy Ghost will come and teach you, 
we're talking about an invisible cosmic power that would be totally consistent with the dark energy quintessence theory. The intelligence is in this m massive 90% of invisible power that would communicate through the ether, you know, the universe, in an invisible way. But you know what? You have to think of something. Think about this. Fine, this is this subatomic stuff, and it's coming down, and, you know, how does this person's head receive this? If, if there is a consciousness somewhere in this, what kind of connection can there be made so that intelligent instruction can get into the brains of these people, into the brains of us? The, the, I mean, your body is created in such a way that it's electrical in nature. There are circuits, all kinds of electrical circuits in there. Uh, so you can feel, think, and do all these different things. But now you're talking of an invisible, non-physical intelligence that is going to uh, teach you and all this kind of business. So there must be some way that this can hit the human brain and harmonize into its circuitry and, and, and kind of talk to it. The brain, the human brain is created almost like a computer, much more sophisticated, of course. But that brain, as a computer, is able to receive only impulses that will follow its electrical circuitry construction. I mean, you know, it, it can't be done with water or it can't be done with cardboard. I mean, it has to be done electrically in some very sophisticated way. And so that's what we have to find out. Oh, it's okay for, the, for this quintessence, this Holy Ghost, this Pentecost to come down. But according to this, and according to, to Carlos Frank, it's an intelligence, it's conscious. According to the Bible, it's an intelligence, it's conscious, it's going to teach us. Well, fine. But then it has to have some kind of electrical properties that will allow us to touch into the circuitry inside of your head. And so it would make sense to you, say. So, in other words, there would have to be a rationale and a scientific way to explain this invisible force, that there's something out there that could communicate rationally and logically to our brain. Now, let me give you an idea of a supposed scientific theory as to how this could possibly work. And it comes from a, a physicist at uh, a website called God and Science Forum. And we'll show you this. And this is what he says. He says, I do so identify the basic and necessary particle of universal consciousness as being the quantum, that's the small, axion particle. Oh, here we are again. Axiom. That's that word that means, well, you know, that's a hypothetical. I mean, there's something now. We, you know, we've got to call it something, so we'll call it axion. Uh, however they arrived at that, I, I didn't really get into that. So he's using the same word here. This is not Carlos Frank. It's a different guy. I didn't get his name. A microcosmically quantum it's so, so small, unit of four predominantly differing flavors. Okay. Now, this is all gobbledygook. You're not going to understand. I don't understand it. That's not the point. The point is this, this guy's trying to say how an invisible electrical force could move in such a way as to make itself recognizable by your brain. A positive particle of positive half integer spin, a negative particle of negative half integer spin, a positive particle of positive integer spin, and a negative particle of negative integer spin. I have no idea what the heck he's talking about. But the point is, 
what he is saying is that this conscious axion, this hypothetical electrical power, in order for it to work out there, that it could start to make sense in the brain in here, then this quantum unit of four flavors, as he's put it, would do it. In other words, if this electrical energy was to operate in the way he's talking here, he's saying that would make it possible for it to get inside of your head and for you to understand what it's communicating. Um, so, you know, that's what's being you know, described. That's what he's trying to describe. But what, what, what he's simply saying is that for an invisible external reality to get inside of our head so that we could understand, we could communicate with God, we could communicate with the Holy Ghost, certain things would have to happen. And this is one of the possibilities that could happen uh, in, in, with these small particles that would cause a communication into the human brain. Now, let me, let me show you something else that's interesting. First of all, just let me backtrack one second. Here's the premise, and, and I think we've all gone through the, the, the quintessence, Pentecost, Holy Ghost, you know where I'm at. If the Holy Ghost is going to instruct us, then there has to be a way that it can impact the electrical structure of the human brain mind, and we've seen this guy's idea as to how that could work. We're all familiar, aren't we, with the religious pictures. And if you would show the next one. What do you notice in this? And this is a religious picture. How do we know it's a religious picture? Because of that. Okay. The, the religious picture of special biblical characters with halos around their head. And, when somebody in the Bible or in these ancient books has a halo around their head, it identifies them as people who are in contact with God. You know, it's, it's, it's a symbol. But then again, it's not. I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about some type of an energy that is impacted on this woman, whoever, whoever that may be. Now, let's take that picture and place it with additional comments from this physicist from, from God in science form uh, in, in, in the next overhead. Now look at the, this here, and what does he say? We report the first results of a high sensitivity watt search for light halo axions through their conversion to microwave photons. This here, which is this, whatever it is, invisible thing inside of, of the dark matter, say, converts to a microwave photon. That word photon means messenger particle. It's a particle of light. But it's a halo axion. It's a, and, and this gives you all the names of the various scientists and physicists who worked on this particular project. So, so these scientists and physicists are the ones that were, were talking that they, they actually got results in finding halo axions, okay, through their conversion to microwave photons. So, in other words, these halo axions converted to like messenger particles of light, and these are the halo axions. And now, you know, because we're still looking at the dark matter, we're still looking at Pentecost, we're still looking at Holy Ghost stuff, and here all of a sudden we come into the, to the realm of the halo. So, now let, let's just, um, let's continue with that, okay, and see what their experiment. Here we have this woman again with the halo. Note that the experiment covered a spread of axion mass outside of the spread indicated by this other scientist, scientist Iskatov, for microleptons. But more to the point, from the experimental and observational data presented at this conference, we must conclude, now let's watch this carefully, 
that some sort of pervasive, that means it's in everything, global, all over the world, quantum coherent medium must exist. What, there is say, what they are saying is based on this halo stuff that they come up with. They are concluding, these scientists, that there is some sort of coherent medium, intelligent. A medium, uh, think of a medium uh, as somebody in a seance. Through that medium comes information to other people. What they're saying here is that there is some type of invisible, small, quantum, coherent means it's intelligent medium by which, you know, you know, information is communicated. And the most likely candidate is an axion condensate, which is exactly what, um, uh, what's his name? Well, the Mexican guy, I, 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 I'm drawing. What is it? Frank. Frank. Carlos Frank. Exactly what he said. Axiom being that something's there, we're not sure which. Condensate being that which forms as the result of the, you know, impulses of the things around it. So some sort of coherent, intelligent medium exists. And the most likely candidate is the axiom condensate. Okay, so in other words, what they're saying, and you saw a lot of these scientists there, they're saying, this guy's right, that this quintessence, Pentecost, Holy Ghost stuff, this dark matter, this dark energy, there is a mind in it. There is intelligence in it. It would then appear the next essential step is to determine coupling mechanisms between the condensate and the physical brain. Do you, do you understand where I'm at? I hope so. The, in other words, there is an in, invisible intelligence out there. And they've said that without getting involved in religion. There's an invisible intelligence out there, and they know that now for a fact, even, even uh, developing this halo thing. They know that for a fact. As does, as does Carlos Frank. They know that there's this intelligence there. What they don't know yet is how this intelligence out there couples with the physical brain. How, how does it impact? How does it affect? How, how, how does it communicate? How does it, how's it get in there? Uh, Jesus in the Bible says that the Holy Ghost comforter is going to come and is going to teach you and is going to do all this stuff. These guys are saying, yeah, there's something out there that could do that. There's no question about it. I mean, that, that's no longer... I, I mean, these guys are not talking about Jesus. They're not talking about angels or halos like this or anything like that. They're just looking and saying there is something there. I mean, you know, from the basis on what they found, these are scientists, a lot of them concluding that there is some sort of coherent medium, which means some sort of intelligent consciousness that must exist. It must. So that, that solidifies all this stuff. Yes, there, there are these light beings out there. And we know that for a fact now. It's not even a question anymore. The point is, how, does, how do they get into our heads? They haven't found that one yet. So the halo, the Holy Ghost, Pentecost, has not only been touched and revealed, as we saw when Jerry Gilmore said, <coughs> This is the first time we've touched something beyond existence. Not only that, it has been touched and it has been measured and now the scientists have arrived at the conclusion that in that dark essence of power there is some sort of coherent intelligence. They know and they agree with uh, Carlos Frank that it is in this uh, hypothetical, 
thing that you know is a result of of the coming together of the powers of this darkness. And now the next step is, how do we get in touch with it? That's what they're basically saying. They're basically saying, yeah, it's there. But now how do we get in touch with it? How do we determine, you know, the coupling mechanisms? What's the mechanism uh, that would bring that into contact with the physical brain? What they are talking about here is they are saying there is no question that there is an alien intelligence all over the place. And now they're saying the next question is how do we contact them? How do they contact us? So the conclusion is that the time of the current Pentecost is at hand and has begun. And it's relevant to the power of Uranus, to the power of Aquarius, to Supernova 1987A, to the Hourglass Nebula, to Eta Carina, bringing to our understanding that the seventh angel has indeed moved on this planet and that the seventh seal is being opened. So what do we do? We, we watch with eyes wide open the changes on the earth, the traditions being torn down, things being turned upside down, the chaotic events, uh, the chaotic natural weather events, the, the dark secrets of the religious people uh, and, and, and the political people being exposed. And we can truly begin to understand that there is some kind of pervasive, coherent intelligence messing with us down here. Now, what about the possibility of an actual physical presence orbiting this earth. And this is where I come up with a, with a disappointment. But, I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to come here and, and, and mishmash around with your head and tell you a lot of stuff that uh, you know, I, can't, I can't prove. I mean, I can prove. I can give you the, you had the names. I can give you the names of the people. I mean, this stuff, there's no question that this is going on. But there was something that, that came, uh, that was noted as the Black Prince. And I indicated this last week, and it came from the Russian news agency, Pravda. Um, you want to put the next one on there. A P black prince alien space probe orbits Earth watching humans. The black prince is watching you. Alexander Kazantsev, a Soviet author of sci-fi books, once said that a mysterious unaccounted satellite called Black Prince was spinning around Earth. The writer believed the object might be an alien probe, a messenger from extraterrestrial civilization. Now, the fact that the guy who said this is a science fiction writer, you know, turned me to plan. But I continued to read a little bit, and I found involvement from someone who I feel was quite credible and certainly deserved another look. And if, and if we'll take a look, this is Ronald Newbold Bracewell. He's the Lewis M. Tamman Professor of Electrical Engineering Emeritus of the Space Tem Telecommunications and Radio Science Laboratory at Stanford University. This guy has a list of credits and credentials that are probably more than anybody I've ever seen. When I saw that, I said, holy cow. This guy's saying that's up there? That the Black Prince is allegedly orbiting the Ars, you know, Earth with intelligence on board, we're watching. So what, then I went back and I looked at what Pravda said about Professor Bracewell. In the next, U.S. astrophysicist Ronald Bracewell was the first to take the hypothesis seriously. In 1960, he published a study to back his conclusions with data of practical radio engineering. The data indicated some strange phenomena which took place during the transmission sessions. The scientists believed the phenomena were caused by the probe's attempts to make contact with Earth dwellers. According to Bracewell, the probe has been in the vicinity of Earth for a long while. The probe will return our calls if we pay attention. Now the reason that I'm showing you this is because last week I made the statement that 
if Professor Bracewell, who was one of the most prestigious scientists in the world, said this, um, you know, how can you argue with that, that there is some kind of a satellite up there with aliens in it looking down on us and so forth and so on. So I looked in, into his work, the Ronald Bracewell's work, and found that what he had written in 1960 was completely hypothetical. In other words, he suggested that there was a distinct possibility that this could happen. But nowhere, and I have gone through you know, hours with that, nowhere can it be suggested that Professor Bracewell has embraced the existence of, of the Black Prince as indicated by Pravda. I mean, here, here, are, here are, are, are statements that uh, he, he commented on the phenomena were caused by the probe's attempts to make contact with Earth dwellers, and he's been in the, 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 this thing has been in the vicinity of the Earth for a long while, and I just wanted to make it clear that this is not true. It is, it is whether there's a, a, a something up there, I had no idea, but it does not involve the Professor Ronald Bracewell. He wrote in 1960 that this kind of thing was hypothetically possible, but he never, in anything that I've been able to find, uh, uh, fulfilled the statements about him that are written here. So, you know, as far as I'm concerned, rolls up and goes in, into the garbage. And, and you know, I, I wanted to make that clear to you because I, I had said last week that, you know, this is really interesting because uh, he is such a guy. But, and, and, and there was a you know, th there was a, a reference to an astronomer by the name of Stephen Slayton, who was supposed to have spotted the Black Prince by telescope in, in 1958, but I found no record of this person other than in the Pravda article. And then there was another reference to a U.S. military expert by the name of Tom Erickson, who was supposed to have commented on the Black Prince but I couldn't find any reference to him other than in that article. So, uh, you know, uh, and this is what people do, you know, whether it be in the news or, you know, it's Fox, not facts, you know, as they say on, uh, you know, the TV. I mean, uh, people just <coughs> add things of their own to make things interesting. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to tell anybody or ever have I. Uh, that you know, I couldn't back up by going to the sources and making sure it was correct. So, but I would have to say, on the basis of what Professor Bracewell actually reported, and the inability that I uh, had to find any documentation outside of the Pravda article, that it is something that should be discounted. So, le let's get back to things that you know are accurate and can stand the test of, of study in the, in the few minutes we have remaining. Some time ago. Uh, we were discussing the pineal gland of the brain. And we discovered a rather strange chemical to be secreted by that gland that had deep spiritual implication. Pineal gland is, is a gland uh, in, in, in your brain, uh, halfway between the, the two eyes. It's, it's, it's called the, also the single eye, the third eye, and so forth and so on. It's, it's the seventh chakra of the Hindu Kundalini and so forth. It's referenced in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Let me show you its reference in both of these. Matthew 6.22, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye be single, your whole body shall be filled with light. Okay, that's referencing the single eye, the pineal gland of the brain. Uh, and enlightenment, and so, in other words, something happens. Second one, this is Genesis 32, 30 in the Old Testament, and Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Now look at that closely. In both instances, there seems to be some kind of hallucinogenic suggestion, doesn't it? I mean, however you want to describe it, you can call it a spiritual encounter or whatever. But, you know, as we discussed earlier, for that to happen, just like they're finding out here, there has to be something that in some way affects the brain. So whether you're going to be filled with light or you're going to see God face to face, 
you are going to have some kind of a paranormal or hallucinatory experience. Now here's two references, the single eye, pineal, seeing God face to face, filling with light. I mean, you, you know, you're going on a trip. Now what we found and reported to you a little, some time ago, not too long ago, was what I want to show you on the screen now. And this is it. Before you change it, just look again. This is the single eye. This is the pineal gland of the brain. This is in reference to seeing God face to face and the word pineal. Now, let me show you the, uh, the scientific. DMT, dimethyltryptamine, right? Occurring psychedelic, dimethyltryptamine are naturally occurring psychedelics found in a variety of plants around the world, several of which are native to the Amazon region. These alkaloids, which are usually found together in the plants, are also found in the human brain as neurotransmitters, as well as our blood, urine, and spinal fluid. DMT is produced in the human pineal gland. Now, this hallucinogenic stuff that leaks out of the pineal gland, certainly, if that thing is roaring, then the Bible would be true. You would be filled with light. Or, I've seen God to face, face to face. You bet you did. Because of DMT. DMT is produced in the human pineal gland, which is correlated to the third eye, or Ajna Chakra, in the Indian spiritual system. Meditative states attained by yogis who concentrate on the third eye may be the result of increased DMT levels. That may be the plan. You see? I mean, basically what the Jesus is saying is stimulate the single eye, the pineal gland, and you'll fill with light. Maybe a bit high. For a good reason. And then in the Old Testament, Jacob says, man, I'm going to call this place Peniel because I saw God face to face. I don't know what he saw. But he obviously got high. And the reason here is a logical and scientific, anatomically correct uh, statement that the reason these are happening in the human body is because the pineal gland secretes dimethyltryptamine, DMT, which is a drug. Now, why I bring this to you, say, because now we got an immediate connection between the single eye, the pineal of the Bible, mind-altering experiences of being filled with light and seeing God, and the revelation that the pineal gland of the single eye, which the Bible refers to, secretes a mind-altering drug. A hallucinogenic, per se. Only in this particular concept, a hallucination would be a movement into another universe, a parallel universe, whereby the encounter with the light beings or Holy Ghost would take place. Now, this is the reason I raise this. I raise this because the United States Supreme Court has very recently, uh, in fact, last week or when February 21st, very, very recently, made a decision of some import that has an effect on this, on this whole subject. Watch. February 21st, Court allows churches hallucinogenic tea. Washington, Associated Press. A small branch of a South American religious sect may use hallucinogenic tea as part of a ritual intended to connect with God, a unanimous Supreme Court ruled Tuesday. The tea, which contains an illegal drug known as DMT is considered sacred to members of the sect, which has a blend of Christian beliefs and South American traditions. Now watch this. Members believe they can understand God only by drinking the tea, which is consumed twice a month at four-hour ceremonies. In other words, the Bible is telling you to get into this thing to stimulate the pineal gland, which will then secrete DMT, and you'll get high. 
They're drinking it. But it's the same stuff. The Bible says, do this and you'll be filled with light. You'll see God face to face. And we find out that the same pineal or single eye secretes DMT, which is a hallucinogenic. And the interesting part is that this thing that God gives us inside of our heads so that we can communicate with him and see him face to face is illegal. It's an illegal drug. <laughs> So we see this South American religious tradition in which the members say that they've got to get that in order to understand God. So it seems that what they say is very consistent with the Bible, except the Bible says you should experience the drug through the pineal and get the experience that way and not by drinking it. So everything we have discussed so far today has to do with mind-altering experiences, whether it's the quintessence, the power coming down, the axion condensate of consciousness, which will get into the circuits of the brain and change the way we think and the way we feel. And even to the point where other scientists are trying to find the vehicle that allows the intelligence, that dark matter, to communicate with us. And now we have to think, could it be through DMT? Do we actually have to get high in order to experience God? Is that what the higher mind is all about? Is that what the upper room is all about? Well, the via the single